So, make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance. If you're like me, that's a difficult suggestion that Jesus is giving us. We rehearse so many things. If a difficult interview is coming up, we rehearse the conversation in our minds over and over and over again. Sometimes we rehearse out loud. Sometimes we utilize our friends to rehearse with so we can practice. Maybe some of you prepare your defense in advance in your friendships or your marriages. You need to talk about something difficult and you get ready. In your head, you make your list. It's the list of things that you did well. It's the list of perceived wrongs done to you. It's the list of things that you want. Sometimes it's even the list of the things we've done wrong. But that's usually our last resort, isn't it? I guess there are many lists and we rehearse and we prepare because we don't want to be unprepared. We don't want to be taken advantage of. We don't want to lose. What situations would Jesus not want us to prepare for and why? In our gospel lesson, Jesus is doing some last minute teaching. It's getting close to the time that he will be betrayed and killed. Some folks unknown to us have asked him about the end times, about the destruction of Jerusalem or the temple. When will it all be? What are the signs? Jesus answered them, beware that you are not led astray because many are going to come and they're going to say that they're me and they won't be. Don't go after them. Don't follow the wrong teachers. Bad times are coming. They come first. But don't be terrified. They have to take place. It's going to happen. So three commands in answer to the question. And I think that this must have been unsatisfactory answers to the curious then and also at least to me. And right afterwards, Jesus gets down to the nitty-gritty with his disciples. He doesn't tell them more about what the end is going to be like. He tells them what the bad times before that are going to be like and what we need to do. He says that there will be wars and earthquakes and famines and plagues. There will even be signs in the heavens. I can remember when I was little talking with my mom about end times, and she said, well, the world's going to end with a nuclear bomb because... That's what everybody thought in those days. And that's the sign. Before all that, though, before whatever those last signs are, there will be a price that Christians pay for their way of life. Jesus is saying that it costs a lot to follow me and to live like the Father wants us to live. It will go tough for you. But all of that will be an opportunity to tell people about who God is and what God's kingdom is like. So bad stuff is going to happen, and it's all an opportunity. And then he follows that with that phrase. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. Huh. Hard to be satisfied with that description of the end times. It doesn't get too specific. And now to say that this strategy that Jesus is giving goes against the grain is an understatement. It looks like we'd be just giving up. I want to be ready. I want to fight. But it isn't giving up. It's worse than that. It's dependence dependence. We don't like to be dependent. We like to be independent. We like to have power. Thank you very much. And Jesus is calling for us to be dependent upon 
him. He's telling us that trust in him is the path of life. Not in what we accomplish. The end times are connected to the mission that we have in this life that we are living right now. And I think these are the assumptions that Jesus is operating with. His followers will show by their lives and their words what God is really like. And that has an impact on the end times. Jesus also assumes that as we do this, we will not be appreciated by everyone. There will be situations that are uncomfortable for you. He says that those situations are opportunities. In those situations, he will give you, give me, any words necessary, any wisdom required. Can we do this another way? There could have been an easier gospel lesson on Stewardship Sunday for me to use to talk about stewardship, but I'm not sure there could have been a better one. Before Judgment Day, before Jesus returns and makes everything right, we have a mission, an opportunity. To accomplish it, we focus on Christ. We brush our spiritual teeth, if you will, and make ourselves dependent upon him. We live our lives as, he inst as Luke instructed us earlier in his gospel. He describes the everyday life of Jesus' followers. I'm sorry, but it, it doesn't get easier. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Stewardship, you ask? Our resources, which are a gift from God, too often we use as our power. Our money or any other resource we have becomes our assurance, our strategy for a rainy day, our help in time of trouble our assurance. And yet God wants us to serve him, not money or any other talent or any power. And then strangely enough, our resources pooled together fuel the mission Jesus has set before us because he is talking to the collective you as he speaks. Father Ralph, the money raised in church is really for the church budget and salaries and stuff. Well, our budget does fund our lights, which we really appreciate on a day like today. Heat, salaries, missions, youth activities, diocesan ministries, and on and on. And it's bigger than that. It makes us dependent upon each other and upon God. I want you to hear that. It's bigger than the lights and salaries and all those other things. It's about us being dependent upon God and upon each other. When we give as God intends, we place ourselves in the position to trust God to care for us. That's where he wants us. That's where he wants us. Father Ralph, how should I figure out how much I should give so that it has an impact on now and on the kingdom that God is preparing when Christ returns? Well, I would tell you to measure yourself against the standard. To that, you might respond, here it is, Father Ralph's going to talk about giving 10% of our income to the church. Well, 
while the Bible does encourage us to give like that, that really isn't the standard. The standard is what God has done for each of us in sending his son to save us. That's the standard of our giving. God has said, because I give, give. That makes it even more difficult to look at the back of your pledge card or the back of this insert that you found in your bulletin. On the back of your pledge card and on the back of this, it just gives some math. Hard numbers to help you think about what percentage of what God has given you that you will give back. And I can easily tell you that it would be good for everyone to move toward 10%. That would be true. I could tell you that you need to move towards 10% and that would be true. I could say that uh, we all need to give more than we spend on particular habits or hobbies that we have. That would be true. What I want, I want, is for all of us to participate. If you look at the front page of this step thing, it has steps with amounts given per week and numbers on top of it. The numbers on top of the steps are the people at St. Thomas. And it tells you how many give in what segment of giving. I want you to know, I don't know what step you're on. I do not know how much you give. I don't plan on it. I want the lower numbers, especially the bottom number, to move up because I want us all to be a team. I want us all to be one as Christ intends. That's why I want everybody to participate. I want us all to be invested in the mission together. But that's probably not the most important thing. Most important, we need to be obedient to God. And in that obedience, we need to be dependent upon Jesus Christ so that when we are brought before kings and governors, neighbors and friends and co-workers, we will be ready for the opportunity to share with others how we have been loved. So I ask you to pray. You have a pledge card in your pew, and in a few moments I'm gonna ask you to have it filled out and and bring it, bring it forward to the mixing bowl. <laughs> I like that image, because that is how I see it, a mixing bowl. And I ask you to pray. I ask you to pray about the reality of this sheet, because when the higher numbers are lower, we as a body struggle to pay the bills. And when the numbers go up the steps, that doesn't happen. And uh, we are in the position at the end of the year again to encourage you to be generous so that we uh, pay all our bills by the end of the year. But more than that, pray. And don't see this as Father Ralph's or the vestries, because it isn't. It's ours, it's our mission together. So please, we'll take a moment of quiet for you to pray in your pews where you are, ask God how you should respond, fill out the card, and then in a couple moments, music will play. At that time, I invite you to come forward and put your pledge into the mixing bowl. Gracious God, we thank you for your love for us, we thank you for your love for us. And we pray, Father, that you would help our hearts to risk being dependent upon you and dependent upon each other and to be one with each other and you as you intend. We pray your blessing upon the stewardship process of our church, that you would receive our talent, our time, our treasure, 
that you would use it and multiply it so that your good news travels in our community and around the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.